Pandora's box is opened. That is always the case if people invent something like a hammer, they build beautiful stuff, or they sometimes they bash people's heads in with it. Welcome to episode three of the Tech Leaders Podcast AI series. Karenza and I have a real treat for you this week. Roger Verkoven from OpenAI. That's right, OpenAI. Roger joins us from the International Short Film Festival in Oberhausen, Germany, where he was part of the production team in a recent AI-generated movie. Roger has been involved in exceptional projects, namely ChatGPT and DALI, to be discussed this, of course. And we also delve into the intriguing world of AI-generated content and explore the true nature of authorship and how this is going to be impacted. We also examine the rapid diffusion of AI technology and the disruptive implications, along with the endless possibilities and also the controversies surrounding AI's role in shaping our creative landscape. Furthermore, we discuss OpenAI's AutoGPT plus the next evolution of ChatGPT 3.5 and 4, we also confront the boundaries of AI and its immense potential. This is a fantastic conversation. Let's jump right in. Roger, thank you so much for coming on the Tech Leaders Podcast. We have been so excited about this one. Where do we start? I, t- I tell you what, I've got an idea. Let- let's start with this. What excites you most about the evolution of AI technology? It excites me that I now have like a a partner, a synthetic partner, like a mm. PA almost also, that does so much uh, of the dreary work for me. But I also see it, of course, it doesn't understand me, but in the dialogue, it seems it understands me. Uh, it doesn't make many mistakes. It does what I want it to do or tries in the creative field and surprises me because it fails often. And the surprises are, uh, you know, taking my work and art in new directions. So I love the surprises. It's awesome that it doesn't perfectly understand me, which OpenAI won't agree because they want perfect alignment, of course, of Mm -hmm. this technology with uh, what humans want from it. Uh, But also, you know, uh, it already was there for a long time doing uh, all the stuff under the hood for the advertising industry. It was already there, finding the right target audiences that were open for the messages, uh, the uh, the commercial messages uh, at the right time, at the right place. So it was already helping us. It's so it was already in our phones for a long time, making all these beautiful pictures as if you have a really awesome camera. And it finds stuff we want to find in these photo albums etc so it was already there but now it's also so visible you know it's almost also addictive because if you in natural language you prompt something and it returns something it's like a a gambling machine almost for uh, what will it pop up will it bring up the right four images that i want or it's really addictive too so there's so many aspects And Roger, it's so good to have you with us. And I'm just interested in your creative process. How do you feel that it's evolving because of the new tools that you can deploy at the moment? How is it pushing you to new creative dimensions? Yeah, that's an interesting one because I'm always, I have the second agenda. So yes, I make stuff I like, but I am not this uh, free autonomously working creative artist, I always am also thinking, how will an audience react? What discussions will come from it? Will I inspire them to work with this technology uh, because that's the goal? Or will I only scare them? Uh, I cannot go too far out Mm -hmm. because then people will perhaps not understand its relevance anymore. On one hand, I would like to do really, really new stuff. On the other hand, I'm doing stuff that people can relate to. And that's also why I work with other artists uh, and bring them on board to uh, give it also a more experimental edge. So I don't have to 
do it all by myself. So give us an example of a, a recent collaboration where you've pushed yourself and other artists have pushed themselves and you've created something new or different or surprising that has really kind of blown your mind. Well, because, you know, I'm here at the Oberhauser Film Festival because uh, of a short AI-generated film is uh, screening here. And um, I asked uh, artist Arno Kuna to uh, work with me and work with a open AI with uh, Dali2. When I asked him, uh, come work with this artificial intelligence, it's awesome. He was against it. He was like... No way, you know, <laughs> art should be for humans and not for machines or synthetic minds. I'm not gonna. And then I showed them what uh, we could do with it. And then he was intrigued, like, mm -hmm. wow, can it do that? And then when uh, we gave him access and he could uh, fiddle along and, and try and work with uh, Dali too, he became the artist he should be. He started testing it, but also he tried to do stuff that OpenAI would perhaps not like. So he would mm. prompt things that would uh, trick Dali into making images and art that are, how do you say, uh, not uh, straight away pleasing or uh, happy, happy. Mm. So he became that artist uh, that uh, I was looking for. And that was interesting because he took it further. He was even kicked out of the program for a while. <laughs> And um, because he used words uh, that OpenAI didn't like or the mm. model, the, the tuned model didn't like much. And so I also had to try and bring him on board again, which worked. And so, so people that are now looking at these results uh, at that movie that we made, yeah, they are amazed that they see stuff moving, talking, and it is all very natural. The animations of these new entities we created, they uh, look like they're really alive. And uh, we also have a lot of humor in it. So people uh, also think it's funny, which is a good thing, of course. Uh, but uh, what they don't understand, what people can't get their head around, it's an AI by D Ideas, uh, uh, another AI company that's uh, working also with uh, the APIs of OpenAI. And uh, what people can't get their head around is that you give it one image of, of an entity, of a creature. Mm -hmm. You write uh, a lot of text that is like 15 minutes, minutes of speech, for instance, and that this AI studies the face, studies the text, uh, makes a speech of three minutes, but it makes it in just a couple of seconds. And we never, as humans, were able to do that. You, a, a rapper could never uh, create a rap of five minutes in uh, one minute. It was not possible, but these uh, AI models are doing that. And that is also what people think is fascinating. It's, it's, it's bending time. Can I ask you a slightly different question, which is what are the most irritating things that people ask you when it comes to thinking about this debate? Or what are the things that are most provocative? People ask me, but then you are not the artist, then the AI is the artist. Mm. Or they uh, ask us, it's not your work, so it is all open AI's uh, work now. They say, yeah, but what you're making is fake. Mm. Uh, so you're dangerous. You're putting fake stuff into the world. Yeah. And I like these concepts and ideas and questions a lot because they trigger the, the most fun discussions about what is real, what is not real, who should own the copyrights. Uh, will an AI do this stuff all by itself or does it really you know, need human uh, input? And uh, so you get really interesting discussions uh, from uh, these questions. Could you give us your sort of rebuttal to that accusation then, Roger? If someone says to you, this piece of art is not yours, Roger, well, what, what would you say back to that individual? I always give them the example of how Jeff Koons works. He is, uh, if he wants to, he wants a big steel balloon dog, then he uh, sends an email to the steel factory that makes these things for him. He, he sends a mail saying, I need a five... A uh, meter high balloon dog this time should be very smooth surfaces. I want it purple, but the purple color has to be transparent so the steel shines through. I don't want to see any uh, lines where you 
connected, welded the steel. When it's uh, finished, send me a couple of pictures so I can judge it. And uh, when he sees these pictures from the steel factory, he says, uh, yeah, 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 it's, this is right, this is nice. Send that one to Dubai, send that one to the United States, uh, to my customers that pay millions for it. So what he is doing is the same thing. He is prompting, but in an email, mm, yes. and the two creatives or workers at the steel factory, but is it then their steel uh, balloon dog because they made it? Or is it Jeff Koons, uh, his steel balloon dog, because he ordered it? And that's the same thing with uh, artificial intelligences like uh, DALI, because you brief them and they make it. And mm. uh, so, yeah, your mind, your creative direction uh, makes uh, not all the difference, but a lot of difference. Yeah, of course, of course. But I uh, thank you for giving us, uh, a, you know, a, a bit more of a simplistic rebuttal, though, because I think that that is a big conversation that people are having right now and are going to have more so over the next couple of years, especially in sort of the education sector, for example, we were talking about with another guest recently uh, and so on and so forth. But let's maybe put this on hold for now then, because I would love to just unpack your background a little bit, Roger, for the listeners who are unfamiliar with yourself. Could you maybe give us a little bit of information on your background and, and, the, and the key milestones in your career that set you on the path that you ultimately ended up following? Yeah. As a kid, I was playing around with uh, the Commodore 64 computer of my daddy. And, <laughs> Me too. Yeah. And uh, I liked <laughs> the aesthetic of these pixels. And uh, then Later on, there was this movie, Tron, the first mm -hmm. one. There was so much computer animation in it. And, and they had this, it was still very crude. Uh, you, you, you had all these polygons, uh, but they used it as a new aesthetic that uh, uh, belonged to that world of uh, the computer inside the computer. And I loved that. And I wanted to make that as well. And then here in uh, the Netherlands, there are these art schools and um, only one, had a new concept and it was working with computers full time to create art. So you, yeah, in the first year, you also had to learn how to paint and how to do traditional art forms. But after that for first year, we could work with computers alone and with nothing else but computers. And it was, that was really cool. So we were doing innovative stuff. We also were not allowed to use software made by software makers. We had to program these computers because otherwise you are stuck with the stuff that uh, others already programmed for you. And after that, in the software industry, uh, people needed creative people that could also make user interfaces. The Encyclopedia Britannica was going to be digitalized by a Rotterdam company that was very innovative, but they also needed little buttons and interfaces. And mm -hmm. so I started designing that for, for the software uh, company. But then advertising agencies saw what I was doing and uh, they thought, yeah, 3D computer animation can be cool. And later, the internet was uh, growing up uh, quite a bit, but uh, most companies still did not really take that serious. So I was, yeah, we should do something with the internet. That's going to be awesome. And then they would be, nah, that's just a gimmick and it will pass away. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know that. Uh, and, uh, but uh, at DDB here in uh, Amsterdam, uh, DDB is an American uh, advertising network. They were like, well, perhaps it's not so big yet, the internet, but we want you to experiment with it. And when we have clients that want something with internet, could you do that for us? But then you also have to do all these, uh, you know, traditional campaigns with uh, television commercials, etc. So uh, when artificial intelligence became a thing, people knew to find me. They knew where I was. And uh, one of the developers, uh, that's key. That's for sure a key moment. One of the developers, I learned to know in that software company at the beginning of my career, he went to Silicon Valley and he saw me fiddling around with very primitive AI. And he said, well, open AI, it's a little research lab and they are going to um, invite people to work with DALI2, their next model. They're looking for a couple of creative directors worldwide 
because they wanted to become a model for the people of the whole world. Would you like to be on board of that project? And I said, yeah, that's awesome. And so OpenAI asked me to join them. And that was a year ago. Wow. And what a journey has been since then, I suppose, then, True. Roger. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, it was a roller coaster. A year ago, I explained at Cannes Advertising Festival that there was something like a, a company, OpenAI, and that they were making, that we were researching this tool that could be a creative companion for creative people. And people didn't know what OpenAI was. And uh, They didn't know what uh, artificial intelligence uh, could do. And so uh, also then again, history repeats itself. People were like, ah, it's a gimmick. Yeah. Oh, you can make images. That's fun. I can make uh, much more beautiful images. Uh, You know, what you're doing with that AI, I, I can do much higher resolutions with Photoshop. So it's gimmicky. But that was a year ago. And now it's uh, incredible how this technology took a flight. Well, how would you describe the culture of OpenAI? What's Sam Altman like as a, as a leader? Because it, it's such a transformative company, or has been so far this year anyway. Just, yeah. just really keen to, to understand what, what, what makes that organization tick. It's two different organizations now. It's the organization before Microsoft's investments and the organization after Microsoft's investments. And um, before Microsoft's investments it really felt like uh, a research lab and a bunch of people with this vision of aligning artificial intelligence with humanity's goals. And they really were serious about it. I never met Sam Altman. Natalie Summers was our contact there. She's really an awesome lady, but she would be the spider in the web with all these creative directors from all over the world. And uh, she would, uh, yeah, explain that uh, OpenAI really did not yet know what to do with a model like DALI because it was not meant to be a creative tool for the creative industry at all. It was just a test to see if the AI is aligned with what humans want. Does it understand what humans uh, want from it? So the prompting, does it understand text And does it come up with the right result following that prompt? Just a testing tool. That was what it was. Uh, So it felt like, you know, being part of a small research team and discovering this technology for the greater good. Finally making artificial general intelligence happening. And this was just a a small step towards that. Uh, It is a very diverse company. That's awesome. I never saw so much diversity. It is nothing like a laboratory. It was uh, more like, yeah, an art school, art academy uh, felt very relaxed. And uh, although the working ethics are, people are so dedicated because they all think it's awesome what they're doing. And we had contact with the developers right away, straight away. There was nothing in between us. So we could, you know, discuss the stuff that we discovered, the the bad stuff, the good stuff, the ideas we had about how the interface should be changed. So we really felt with this small group of people, like we are building it, we are changing it, we are improving it. But now, yeah, then all of a sudden, well, all of a sudden, you cannot go on being a research lab forever if you don't have the money to do the research. So the investments of Microsoft were very welcome, but that did change a lot. And of course, the GPT revolution in September, that changed a lot too. That's also something OpenAI did not anticipate. They did not uh, anticipate that it would boom so fast and so big because DALI was not straight away embraced by the world, you know, it was the creative professionals and animators and manga designers, game designers. So it was a niche uh, in the creative industry that wanted to experiment with DALI too. But Jet GPT, it's so easily accessible. You, you just type something, it talks to you. It's a, the chat format, that's genius. And nobody feels the fear of... Uh, I'm afraid it's a, am I going to do right or wrong? Am I going to look stupid? (laughs) But with DALI 2, people had the idea of DALI 2 returned something ugly. Oh, it's my fault. I'm not creative enough. And now DALI 2 produces something ugly. So the, (laughs) and that's, that did not happen with 
chat GPT, totally different thing. Just before we, we talk a bit more about chat GPT, which I think will open up a whole different scene of conversation. Yeah. I do want to go back to the innovation journey at OpenAI. I think it's really interesting that they set out to test the AI's ability to do that kind of that understanding comprehension piece, almost like being able to translate what does a human being say? Can we play it back? Do we understand it enough? At what point in the innovation journey did it start tipping into, actually, we've kind of accidentally created one of the world's most incredible creator tools that the creative industries can benefit from? On the creative side, we were amazed that it uh, always returns something. So it's ne- it, it would never tell us, I don't understand. It would always return something, or if we used words that uh, OpenAI already had labeled as inappropriate, then it would uh, return a warning sign. uh, Mm. Don't do this uh, too often because you will be put out of the program. And uh, which sometimes happened to some people, but uh, then they were let back in because it was research phase. uh, But that was really surprising. It always returns something. But also the surprises, the so stuff that never existed before, it would also try and make that. So if we would ask it for mashups of the first thing that I did was mashups of my culture, uh, Delft Blue earthenware with American pop culture, Star Wars. So I asked uh, Dali to create me a Delft Blue Stormtrooper busts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, no problem, you know, it would straight away produce those things or mix-ups of animals and stormtroopers, and it would do that. And that was really cool. And it was not just like it's a stormtrooper, but it has the snout of a dog or something silly. Mm-hmm. No, it, it made very intricate mashups of these concepts of what is a stormtrooper and what is a frog for instance Mm. and that was amazing people thought that it was really thinking how to tinker uh, this uh, out and uh, yeah but basically it was predicting what pixel should be next to the other pixel to create Mm. a stormtrooper frog i asked dali create me an astronaut that is uh, uh, enjoying a popsicle you know (laughs) an ice cream popsicle yes and uh, astronauts have these helmets on, and so they can't. Then Dali created, uh, first it created an image, and you would see the popsicle, but then it slipped on the screen of the astronaut. Mm-hmm. Then it created inventions. How can I, under the visor, create something that an astronaut could put in uh, the popsicle? Mm-hmm. So it would come up with solutions that this astronaut could eat a popsicle. And then I would even confuse it. And I showed it to Natalie Summers. I said, look, I said, it has a sense of humor because (laughs) of the popsicle, you know, on the screen, on the visor. Uh, It has a sense of humor, uh, which it doesn't. You know, it's us interpreting the image as uh, humoristic. And, oh, look, it's intelligent because it's looking for solutions to to have this astronaut eat the popsicle. Uh, but it is not at all intelligent. You know, it, it then uh, finds in its big data set images of, uh, uh, not images, but knowledge, because there are no images there, but the knowledge of people eat popsicles through a mouth. So then it would blend mouth kind of stuff, uh, things in these helmets. And we concluded that it came up with smart solutions, but it was just, you know, blending these concepts. And uh, so it was confusing sometimes. So at what point did the team think, actually, this could be something that could be used in a completely different way to what we'd originally conceived? Because that, that's what's really innova- interesting yeah. about the innovation journey. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Because uh, that we got also, we were... Uh, no kidding, they were also doing psychology tests on us because they really uh, were very precautious. Uh, Is it addictive, you know, to mm. make all these images? And, and we went on for hours. Sometimes I worked uh, uh, 20 hours a day with this uh, technology. Gosh. So it, it was, so they were researching us. And they, one of the questions was also, 
what if we would stop the DALI program? The, the group of people uh, we were, we would say, that's oh, that would be terrible because this could be helpful for humanity. This could be a great tool for people that have difficulty uh, explaining themselves our, or with autism to with a tool like this, communicate with us. We would come up with all sorts of reasons not to kill the DALI program. and But they really thought when we got the AI aligned, then we don't need DALI anymore because it was just a test tool. But then Midjourney came out with a model, mm-hmm. uh, Midjourney 1. It was a bit of a copycat of uh, OpenAI, text to image, mm-hmm. a, a little bit more complex uh, on the Discord uh, servers. And they were asking money for it. Then at OpenAI, uh, I don't know how these things worked, but people decided, hey, if Midjourney is making money with it, perhaps we should also give that a try because it's such an expensive experiment also, you know? <laughs> uh, yes. And even the, the billions you have, you will burn them eventually. And then they thought, hmm, perhaps we should also put it out slowly and have uh, people uh, uh, on board outside our research group and uh, think of a, a monetization solution well, are we, go, are we going to ask uh, money per render or are we going to, are we going for su- subscription models? So then they were thinking about it, it, we should probably make money of it because of mid-journey. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Can I ask you about ChatGPT then? I, I'm sure you've noticed this, Roger, and, 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 and yourself as well, Karen, so I think we actually spoke about it, Karen, so obviously Italy banned chat GPT due to privacy yeah. concerns. And I think there were a couple of other concerns as well. Are the Italian government completely, are they outliers here? Or are you seeing more concerns by institutions and governments? Are we going to see more problems for chat GPT going forward? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I think the Italians uh, in uh, in a way are right. But I, I, I think they should uh, uh, pick it up with Europe as a whole. And uh, and I think these concerns are right because yeah there is uh, of course uh, OpenAI was quite uh, cautious with uh, only training the model on uh, stuff that's already out there in the open, uh, so it's not going to steal your data, but the data and everything that uh, you shared somewhere and it has access to uh, yeah it uh, it can happen that it was trained on that as well. Mm-hmm. But you did not give consent. Uh, perhaps you put your stuff on on Facebook or wherever, but you did not say if a AI model is tra- going to be trained on this, then I think it's okay. So uh, people did not put their stuff online to have models trained on it. But yeah, also like one of the Google uh, people. Uh, uh, Wrote, a, wrote an interesting book, Societies That Share More are the more successful so- societies as well. It's the success of Homo sapiens as a species is sharing, mm. sharing, sharing, knowledge, knowledge, copying, oh. see somebody doing something smart, uh, try to do it also is the success of Homo sapiens. So if we would now back off and with the European community say, yeah, uh, now we are not going to allow this technology or you cannot just train your models uh, or the people, the people will say, no, nobody can use my data, then that will uh, stop progression, I think. And I think that the European citizens, if they want this awesome technology to augment them and help them and do all the dreary stuff and uh, and, and do awesome creative stuff together with the people of Europe, then the people of Europe perhaps should think by themselves, yeah, what stuff do I not want to share? What is the real stuff? Okay, you know, if you're having a a beautiful, loving moment with your loved one. Perhaps you don't want that to be in a model, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that I think is uh, not going to harm your situation if that is in these models and it, these models can help you then even better. So, But perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm a, a bit naive. I, I am on that side of the spectrum. But what I think would be a good idea is to, with Europe, 
decide on creating a CERN for AI development, like, you know, the space station mm-hmm. with the, where all these, these countries uh, participated in, and CERN, all these countries should together develop uh, AI in a fashion that fits uh, the European democracy. I mean, there are so many angles on the ethics debate, aren't there? I mean, there are people who are maybe creators in their own right. They may be artists, videographers, sculptors, photographers, poets, writers who find a kind of, that they're not quite sure how to navigate this landscape where new creations are being created as kind of derivatives of some of the inputs that they may not have willingly or knowingly shared. And I I just wonder whether Mm. you, from your perspective, because you are a creator who uses these technologies Mm. to make new things, do you have some sympathy with that argument? And and how do you how do you talk to artists who are fearful of how, how to navigate this new world? First, I'll, I'll tell them there's some artists that are prompted a lot because mm-hmm. people like their work. And the work of those artists is not in the system. It is a understanding of the work that is in the system. But if you prompt a bouquet of flowers in the style of a certain artist, then it will look like in the style of that artist. But these artists were not so famous before the boom of people uh, prompting these. So I think it's also an awesome PR tool. Uh, There are now artists that uh, can ask large amounts of money for just talks about their experiences with artificial intelligence and uh, how people are prompting them. But they became so famous because... All of the sudden, it was a thing. From oh, people are prompting my name to create work in that looks a bit like my work, and yeah, but yeah, I I would say that's that's awesome. It's free publicity for you. But if you want to opt out, that is still a possibility. You can demand that your work is not um, in the training model. But I would say, you, you know, also. The stuff that is in the model, building a model is quite uh, expensive and it takes some time. So the stuff that is in the model, you are already, as an artist, you're much further. So let people play with your old uh, styles and have mm-hmm. fun with your old styles. You become famous through it and then you can show the next level where you're at. You can show what you're now creating and people will love it and it will not be in a model because it's too, you know, too slow. It takes too much time to uh, put that stuff in the model. Uh, but if uh, the stable diffusion people train new models with your style, then you are already further. And it forces you also to be uh, innovative with your style. So you will see as an artist that you are surprising yourself. It's like in the fashion industry where the fashion industry said a while ago, let's not fight each other in court anymore because of a jacket that looks like our jacket, but is different on seven points. (laughs) Let's just invent fast fashion and not have just four seasons of uh, new stuff, but let's make new stuff every week uh, so that copycats cannot even catch up. Uh, So not fighting each other in court has been a creative boost for the fashion industry. Uh, pity for the environment, of course. Yes. That's the, the turn uh, side of the core. Uh, but not going to court about uh, whatever will uh, boost the pace of the creative development. Mm-hmm. I really loved your, your analogy of the fashion industry, though. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good comparison, actually. So I wanted to ask you about your LinkedIn title, your headline on LinkedIn, uh-huh. I think, is yes. brilliant. Okay, AI yes. will not replace you. A person using AI will replace you. I mean, I thought that was genius. And uh, I've actually referred to that twice in conversations recently. So the question is, Roger, what, what do you think the impact on the labor market will, how profound will it be over the next couple of years as AI technology evolves? Yeah, it will be very disruptive. You know, computers, when computers, or home computers were becoming... Um, cheaper and everybody could uh, or companies could afford all these home co- or, or these desktop computers for people to work with. Then also there were people that said, I'm not going to work with a computer. It's a silly thing. It's, uh, hmm. it's stupid. And uh, But yeah, the people working with computers replaced the people not willing to work with computers. 
and uh, so uh, history is repeated, uh, repeating itself. And uh, but what people think is that uh, AI will make some jobs obsolete. I think you know call center people, they will lose their jobs uh, because AI models can be stabilized all the time, very friendly, and you know they're very good at dialogue now. But uh, is that a place where we should have humans? You know, in call centers. Uh, we're, and hearing all these complaints about products and services of people, uh, is that a nice job to have for people? Or should we, as fast as we can, replace these people with uh, chat GPTs sort of technologies? There will also be new jobs, you know, uh, because yeah. even if you're not a designer, now with a model like uh, Midjourney or uh, Dali or Stable Diffusion, you can do artwork for local entrepreneurs that never could afford uh, decent, expensive advertising from the advertising agencies. But if you uh, were working in a, a call center and you lost your job as a call center uh, operator, uh, you can try and find fun stuff to do with AI, like uh, being a, becoming a designer, for instance, for your local entrepreneurs and shopkeepers. Uh, and, and so this Technology is also going to create new jobs. You know, there's there's companies now looking for prompt engineers, and they they are serious yeah. in, in it. It's not just a PR stunt, but they are really looking for prompt engineers, and you can make a decent living with it too. So new uh, professions will also be there, and also in the advertising industry, it's not that a layer of people will be out of a job, but they will move on, augmented with artificial intelligence. They can do the stuff that the only the companies working for brands like uh, Nike could afford because that uh, you know that awesome stuff they made would take a, a lot of resources time and money and now augmented with uh, artificial intelligence all brands can afford that kind of awesome work and the creative people that work for these awesome brands uh, like uh, Nike they will now have to astound themselves and find the next level of creativity. So I think it will be an enormous boost for the creative industry. And also we'll need much more people working with these AIs and understanding the models and being fresh, coming up with fresh ideas. Because we are already now seeing that the people working with these AI models make stuff that uh, sounds the same. You can almost recognize chat GPT or GPT-4, you can recognize uh, straight away uh, mid-journey images or uh, stable diffusion images. So, um, so to be original and fresh, you need original and fresh uh, thinkers. There will be more demand for these people as well. It will create a lot of new opportunities for entrepreneurs and people. Yes, I mean, uh, I would say that obviously, I mean, at BT and EE, we have fantastic contact center staff and they are they are rather brilliant, obviously. But I would say that one of the thoughts that's crossed my mind is all through history, as technology has evolved, the types of jobs that human beings do have also evolved. So, you know, at the time when yep. the, the, the motor vehicle grew in prominence and took over horses and carriages, you know, you didn't need as many groomers and you didn't need as many stable boys and girls and you, di you didn't need all the kind of carriage polishes. The changing nature of tech means that we adapt, we adapt, we adapt. And the beauty of the human being is that we are incredibly adaptive creatures. And I think you're, you're absolutely right, Roger, in the sense that this actually opens up a huge range of possibilities in, in so many different ways, many of which we can't even begin to predict or imagine. And that's quite exciting. But I, I absolutely also sympathise with an awful lot of people who might do some of the more repetitive type of jobs um, in, in, in factories, manufacturing, all sorts, of, all sorts of places or administration that might be very fearful that what does this mean for me, for my family, for my, my income potential? So it, we are treading into sort of very uncharted waters. And I think we we as as kind of as tech leaders and creative leaders can can help pave the way for that and, and help show the opportunity. So I, I love that, you know, you're able to kind of share some of those examples of the possibilities and, and the kind of the, the positive outcomes that this could lead to. Yeah. And you, you also, you know, this movie, Her, quite a while ago, there was a guy with a 
profession, uh, he wrote uh, love letters for mm-hmm. people uh, that ordered yeah. love letters that that wanted the human human written love letters. So mm-hmm. yeah, that was a profession we still don't have. Serrano de Bajarek as well. Yeah, yeah there yeah. you go. Yeah, and uh, there's there's also a lot of people that want the genuine uh, human thing. Mm because they think that is more special to them. And so if there are going to be companies that say, yeah, we have the call centers with the the real people and the, the, there won't be any chatbots there, real people, but then also the chat will change. Yes. And people will then also want to pay for talking to a real person because it's special. And then if you talk to these people, you want it to be like a half an hour instead of uh, just fixing a problem in five minutes. You know, so the chat bots will be very useful fixing the the problems that need to be fixed in five mm-hmm. minutes very politely. And, uh, and, and uh, but there will be new call centers where uh, it's fun and nice to work and you feel also much more relevant because mm-hmm. you're not just fixing the vacuum cleaner court uh, problem of a manufacturer, but then you will really have relevant deep conversations with the people that choose to have those so yeah i think everything it will not replace all there will be communities that will say there's no ai in our community so visit our holiday park and there will be no ai interfering with your uh, relationship and your fun vacation with your kids in our holiday park and uh, and there's like you know that there's now people that don't or they're uh, nuns for instance they want to serve jesus christ so they say no man in our community we are serving jesus christ and uh, yeah that you can choose that that's the beauty of uh, our societies you can choose how you want to live and there will also be people that want artificial intelligence they will pray to their new God because they think it's the next step in evolution and they think they want artificial intelligence to be their new God and will then create communities that live the life of AI and they want to upload themselves to computer systems like Elon Musk promised them he would be able to do. This revolution will not just change our world a little bit, like uh, it's uh, the work we're doing will be done faster. It will totally, completely uh, do stuff we never anticipated. My favorite use case for ChatGBT, I've got to tell you, okay, is to do book summaries. I've got an endless list of books I want to read, okay, but I just do not have the time to read them. (laughs) So I do, I use ChatGPT for book summaries. What's your favorite use case, Roger? And what's your favorite use case, Carenza, for ChatGPT? What may be something you've discovered recently? Yeah, what I think is awesome and what really surprised me is uh, how the GPT models are I- embedded in things like auto GPT and uh, there's agents at GPT. So you're not directly only working with a GPT model, but uh, you will give it a task and then it will try to make that task happen, will try to finish it and will try whatever it can do to make uh, uh, but what i'm seeing now i see kids doing crazy science fiction stuff like uh, oh uh, auto gpt destroy the world and uh, of course there are safe uh, there there are you know open ai has a lot of safety measures built in the gpt models but if you become really smart and you know how to trick it with metaphors to do stuff i think it's fascinating because technically if you would give it a task like i want uh, you to put all the traffic lights on green in our country <laughs> it will try and make that happen. So if you keep the computer on, and if you're a patient or you go uh, about with your life and you leave the computer on, GPT, the model in auto GPT will go on and go on and go on till it finds zero days, uh, the, the leaks that we didn't discover yet. So, and then it will use those leaks. Uh, it does uh, tricks already, you know, it uh, hired a person already in a, a situation, a research situation. GPT hired a person to solve a CAPTCHA for it because because it can't, it's a robot. 
uh, but it hired it lied to a person from TaskRabbit. Okay, you s solve this captcha for me because I am blind. And then this person thought, yes, sure, I will help you. So this auto GPT with these tricks uh, in uh, in the back of our mind. It could happen that all of a sudden, perhaps two years from now or two weeks from now, all the uh, traffic lights in your country will be on green. <laughs> and that's not a good thing, of course. It is fascinating. And now I wonder, is this not something we should really uh, um, stop, you know? Sure. The automation of GPT. So, yes, it's fascinating. I think it's also cool for me to have it tasks uh, do for me. Uh, but also I see, uh, yeah, what harm can be done uh, with it. I mean, for me, uh, um, I've been quite excited to see that you can draw a wireframe and ChatGPT can convert it into working code. I think that is very clever and very exciting on a very yeah. prosaic level. And this is probably quite uncreative actually for someone like me who actually loves creating things and I've done all sorts of exciting sort of artwork with it but one of the things I most use it for I'm using Bing quite a lot and I'm finding it very yeah. very helpful because I have a journalism background to actually cross source different source material to verify because I always believe in not just getting one source of the truth but getting multiple sources of the truth then you cross reference then you can be a little bit more confident yeah. in what is the truth so I'm finding it incredibly helpful for research articles. I can ask a simple set of questions and get a whole series of outputs back with a bunch of ready-made resource tools for me to create a briefing and upgrade myself so that I can then prepare myself for for making a talk or presentation or leading a webinar or whatever I need to do. So it, it radically simplifies my methodology it helps me synthesize the data, crunch it down, work out what's important, and then and then cross-reference amongst multiple sources. Yeah, that is awesome. And uh, uh, you let, let it write code for you, and it will also show you the code that in uh, in a model uh, that's the good side, like in Auto GPT. If you want it to make a email address for you somewhere, uh, for some reason, and uh, then uh, it will. Uh, uh, tell you it will show you what it does to create it it will also show you that it then will create an email address for itself so if the email address you want the email company will then send gpt uh, an email to confirm and gpt <laughs> will confirm it yes. and then that company will make you an email address but you can see it so the auto gpt also shows you and now i'm going to write a little bit of code because the company i want to create your email address there's a little bit of code lacking and i'm now making it and this is the code and gpt uh, as says in auto gpt and now i'm going to check the code mm. if it's good so you don't have to ask it anymore check the code it will also check the code yes it's a workable code now i implement it so step by step you see uh, what it does you can also ask it to ask permission after all phases so if it's doing stuff you don't agree with you can say no this is going too far stop it here uh, it will also uh, get you involved in the whole process and i, I like what you're doing uh, that's quite similar but uh, i'm wondering what you would do with auto gpt i would uh, really love uh, to see you experimenting with a tool like that which is augmenting chat gpt even yeah. have you used auto gpt PT Carenza. No, not yet. Yeah, have you... No, not yet. I, I've been trying all... No, neither have I. Yeah, I've been trying all kinds of... I, I mean, it, luckily, in the scope of my job, I get the chance to... I mean, I, it's it's work, but really it's playing. It's like I get to do a huge amount of experimentation, which is really fantastic. And no, I haven't actually thought through all of the different potential use cases I'd like to try out with that, but um, it's definitely on my list for this year. Yeah. yeah. Likewise. Can I just ask you as well, Roger, how much of a step forward is chat GPT-4 from 3.5, which I think is the first version that most of us uh, played with? And what have OpenAI got in the pipeline to evolve this product? 
in, in the sort of immediate term. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Well, the step forward for uh, between the 3.5 and 4 is amazing. It's uh, it's huge. It's uh, not just a bit, but... 50%? Now it's really a huge leap. And it's also now good at uh, the reasoning, which the, the previous models were not good at. So now you can give it an image and there's a joke hidden in it. And you can ask GPT-4, what is funny about this image? And it will tell you. It understands what is funny oh, about the image. 3.5 couldn't do that. It can also, you know, if you have a situation where there's a, a, a boxer's glove hanging about a, a plank and it's wobbly balancing on something round and there's a thingy laying on the end. And if you ask GPT-4, what will happen if I release the boxing glove? Then it can go through all these steps and predict what will happen. Mm. Uh, so it's reasons for a bit. And that is also what even the people at OpenAI are surprised about, that it uh, reasons uh, at OpenAI, they call these sparks. Yeah, because of, you know, it looks like sparks of awareness. And still uh, we, we, we say, hey, these are prediction models. There's no awareness there at all. But we see these sparks that look a lot like being a bit aware, if you can reason, you know. But still at OpenAI, we say, no, it's just a good puzzler. But it's, uh, you know, um, it's really doing some smart stuff now. And that's a big difference. So the next models, OpenAI doesn't think that this is the next the step to artificial general intelligence. But what uh, OpenAI in the world learned from developing these prediction models is going to help OpenAI and the world to uh, know in what other direction OpenAI should go for artificial general uh, intelligence development. So this will be a profound phase coming to conclusions and learning for humanity, but it will not. this will not be the way because what OpenAI also learned is that the bigger you make it, it uh, doesn't per se get smarter. Uh, it's even you can make it smarter by making it smaller even. So there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, learning going on in OpenAI. And so, uh, you know, uh, people think that OpenAI has all the knowledge and can predict the future, but Sam Altman even can't. Sam Altman is even surprised about what uh, GPT-4 is doing now. Now, Sam Altman even says sometimes, yeah, perhaps it is aware a bit, which uh, uh, we then uh, all say, no, it's not. It's a prediction model. And, but if he dares to say that, you know, there was a guy fired at Google not so long ago for saying that kind of stuff. And now Sam Altman is saying this kind of stuff. Uh, so at OpenAI, there's also a lot of, there are also different camps uh, there and uh, so it's not the company that uh, has all the answers. But what I like about the uh, company of OpenAI is that they are trying their best to um, to test it, to get it aligned, to help become a, a fantastic tool or a set of tools for humans. The plugins uh, OpenAI is now developing, those are amazing. That is really also, uh, Karenza, for you, an interesting th uh, one. The plugins that you now can develop with OpenAI, uh, that is really cool. And you can custom make tools and AI tools for your company with the uh, developers of OpenAI. And it's, uh, it will be trial and error also. It's a uh, research still. But what I like about OpenAI that is that there is still this mentality of helping uh, humanity, although yeah, a lot of money is involved now, but yeah, some people stay idealistic. I love that about uh, OpenAI is also the, the chat GPT models. You, it won't crack a joke on the expense of another people. Uh, you can't ask it to make uh, uh, jokes about Germans. Yeah, you can ask it, but it won't do that. It will say, well, that's not a nice thing to do. It's disrespectful. You could hurt people's feelings. Is it, I would advise you to do this and that. And I like that about uh, the development also in this technology that it uh, is uh, also a very polite uh, technology still. It's very human, what, what we would humans to be like. Yeah, what that will mean for the future, uh, who knows? Yeah, and the interface between human beings and the way that the machines are learning is quite interesting and helping people build those critical thinking skills is going to be quite vital, I think, because as you say, 
you can perceive that there is reasoning going on and there is logic going on and it's following. But actually, it's all based on the training data and it's all based on the quality of that training and the volume of the training. And I think helping people understand what is actually going on is going to help help people better use an interface with it. Yeah, yeah, that is very true. And it's irreversible. So it's evolution also, you know. There's also people that say, yeah, but this is the logical thing. Biological intelligence makes tools. And when the tools get complexer, then it wants a tool that thinks for the biological intelligence. And uh, so, uh, and then the, bio, the, the artificial intelligence, uh, the, uh, then we have uh, the moment that it is equally intelligent and then it will perhaps uh, see us as competitive uh, with the resources of uh, the planet. And uh, then you have the Neanderthal Homo sapiens situation again, that one intelligence has to leave the arena. So I, I advise, have a lot of fun, enjoy this period in uh, the evolution of intelligence. And uh, Pandora's box is opened. <laughs> Let's make the best of, uh, of it because there's so much amazing stuff happening also. Yeah. And that's also, that is always the case if people invent something like a hammer, they build beautiful stuff or they sometimes they bash people's heads in with it. And uh, so, yeah, that's Homo sapiens. And what I like about GPT <laughs> models is that people, when I tell somebody, you are not polite, then the other one gets aggressive and say, oh, who are you to tell me I'm not polite? But if a GPT tells somebody that's not polite, people have to change their strategy and become polite to work with uh, GPT. So it's also an educator, I think. So let's maybe finish on this one then, Roger. What advice do you typically give or would you give to fellow creatives earlier in their career who want to sort of pursue a similar career path to yourself? Do they want to express themselves through AI technology. What kind of advice do you give to those people? It's not easy because you have to be a curious person. So if you are uh, not curious, uh, but uh, you're a good crafts person, that uh, if some something is invented and that you can be the craft uh, person with it, and you're not at all curious, uh, it is still what it always was: follow your heart. So, so are you a curious uh, person, and do you like? Do you think this is fun? then uh, try it, uh, try the DALI models, the GPT models, the mid-journey, the, the, the stable diffusion, try and build your own model with stable diffusion, it's open source. But if you don't like it at all, or you think it's too technical, there's now extra space also for people that say, I wanna be a stop motion animator, old fashion style, or I'm gonna sell handwritten uh, letters with ink, with a uh, fountain pen and sell those because because there's the human uh, element is there. There's now also a new demand coming up for genuine human uh, creative endeavors. So my advice is follow your heart. And if you don't like it, don't go with it. Then yeah, you will not be in the industry using this, but you will invent new industries like writing love letters, real human written mm -hmm. love letters. So. Following your heart is the, uh, still the most important advice, I think. Uh, where can people find you, Roger? Where, where can people find your the movie you've worked on uh, with your partner recently? And uh, what other cool stuff have you got coming up that people can check out? I'm also, uh, since February, uh, executive creative director at a company called IO, which is a company uh, where they combine uh, technology and creativity in very exciting ways. A very open-minded uh, company. So they can find me there. IO Digital, uh, it is called. So check me at IO Digital. But also I share the stuff at uh, LinkedIn uh, all the time. The stuff I'm uh, making, also the art projects. But also the because companies with their new AI models also approach me like, well, hey, Roger, uh, can you test this for us? And then I will share the results of those tests, if it's okay with these companies, uh, also on LinkedIn. So the latest experiments uh, uh, are on LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is perhaps the best thing. So LinkedIn probably. Roger Werkhoven with a D. Roger with a D. Brilliant. Fantastic. We will put it on the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, welcome.
Wow, Carenza, that was a conversation we're not going to forget in a hurry. <laughs> what a, what no, a big character it, Roger is. <laughs> he's wonderful. It's it, He's like a human roller coaster. Um, it was absolutely <laughs> brilliant <laughs> listening to him. He's just a firework of creativity. Indeed. And I loved hearing his journey. I absolutely loved as well him taking us through the initial phases of, of how it all started. I mean, I've never heard that before. I really felt yeah. like we were getting bit of an insider scoop yeah i'm, I'm uh, just just to uh, i think we did say early on in the interview but roger was at, actually at a film festival wasn't he because he's involved yes. in um in, a, in an ai generated film but what a big buoyant character i think there was a couple of things that stood out maybe but the one thing that resonated with me is is this period in the evolution of ai technology he was saying that this was we need to make the most of this period of innovation because once pandora's yes. box has been opened things are yes. going to change a lot yes i mean it was such a privilege to kind of be sitting talking to someone who's a globally renowned thought leader in this space i mean his views and his creativity are so valued across the world by so many different companies he's often pulled in on a consultancy basis and obviously he helped with the beginnings of dali and that is quite an incredible kind of credit to his name it was really interesting as well just hearing his excitement about conversational AI and the way that our use of AI over time is going to change. We can't predict it, but grasping, as you say, that Pandora's box as it's beginning to open right here, right now, and embracing the possibilities it opens up for us. He's staring into it with, with, with fierce excitement and energy. And I think anyone who listens to the interview will go away and want to play with some of these tools. That I, I, I defy anybody to listen to that interview and not want to have a little play. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly what I did straight away. <laughs> straight yes. after the interview. <laughs> Bibs and breathes this world. So, I mean, it was a yes. privilege to get him on. I was really excited when he accepted our request. So what a, what a fantastic conversation and one that I won't forget in a hurry. Even though he's a creative, buoyant character, he is quite cautious as well, I think, Renzo, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think he's creative, but within within the parameters of what is safe. But at the same time, he does encourage risk taking in the way that he creates. Yeah. And I think, you know, as long as he, you know, getting that balance right and being very thoughtful about it, I found I found some of his ideas around the the potential implications of workforce very interesting. I mean, you even mentioned it yourself, Gareth, in the interviews. Um, the, the fact that his LinkedIn tab, he even says, you know, AI won't take your job, but someone using AI will. Um, yes. And I think his whole philosophy is that AI is the most incredible enabler. And mm. of course, we can't predict um, all the different ways it's going to act as an enabler. And we're going to need all those skills and 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 the, you're going to need a workforce of people able yeah. to control it, to manipulate it, to play with it, to unleash it. Yeah. Um, and I think he made the points incredibly well about how sometimes you will want to use an AI to uplift productivity and efficiency. Other times, it's going to be more appropriate to to use a human. And I yeah. think getting that balance right is going to be it's going to be very very important going forwards. Yeah. I, do you know? Do you know what though? That line of AI will not replace you. A person using AI will. That's what. That's probably the most impactful sentence I've heard in this whole thing since 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 the beginning of the year. Because I, I, that really resonated with me, and it's something that I, I I brought that up in numerous conversations since we started yes. doing the research before we spoke to Roger. So thank you for that one, Roger. You were very uh, very impactful conversation for me, especially, and I'm sure for for Karenza yes. and the listeners. Yes, absolutely. What a rock star. As you quite possibly have heard me mentioning in the past, we record the mass majority of our episodes at an amazing studio facility here in Cardiff at Tramshed Tech. Tramshed Tech is a collaborative community of entrepreneurs and scaling businesses geared towards supporting growth in tech, digital and creative industries across an ever-increasing collection of locations and partner locations UK-wide and internationally. It really is the perfect place for your business to start up, scale up, accelerate or innovate. Head over to tramshedtech.co.uk or just search Tramshed Tech on your favourite social media platform. (laughs) 